What's up guys, welcome to Daily Refinement. This is Reseller Car Talk number five. And I wanna talk about my sales plummeting. It's not clickbait. So my sales are down about 40% this week, but probably not for the reason that you're thinking. So please smash the like button, consider subscribing. Let's get into it. Last week I actually asked my staff to take voluntary paid time off. If they didn't want to do that, I still had stuff for them to do, but I essentially ran out of inventory. That's the first time that has happened to me ever in the history of me reselling since 2017. Um, 2016 is when I started. I sold all the stuff around my house. 2017, I started taking it seriously and I started this YouTube channel. And from then till now, I've never run out of inventory. Last week, I actually went on vacation in the middle of the week with my kids because I had nothing to sell. So I had about 300 pallets of inventory scheduled to arrive this week. Today is Tuesday and I'm recording it. It was supposed to arrive Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, one truck per day this week. And all of it came yesterday. So yesterday I received five truckloads, which is absolutely bananas. Luckily, my entire shop is empty, so it was no problem receiving that much. But my I've always been saying this, but I haven't really practiced it until now. I don't buy bad inventory if I can help it now. The only way I would buy something that doesn't match what I'm looking for is to get a deal. And today I wanna to share a story that happened to me that helped me get what I was looking for. And hopefully these ideas can help you and it'll give you some insights on how I negotiate deals. So right now, I've always been pushing a small expensive store. If you're doing this by yourself, you don't have a lot of time to list hundreds of cheap items. You really only have enough time to list one to 10 bangers every day. In fact, if I could restart my eBay store today, I would probably have a store called Only Bangers and I would spend 90% of my time looking for deals and 10% of my time listing, processing, storing, shipping. I love the idea of a store that sells only iPhones and the goal is to sell one to five iPhones a day and you have every single kind of ad out there. You're asking all of your friends, your friends at the Apple store, trying to get people's information to try to buy one to five cell phones a day. There's a lot of a lot of learning curve to figure out how to sell cell phones, but it's worth it because you have a small, expensive store. Your average sale price would be two or three hundred dollars, and you can make a good profit with a very small footprint. You could also do an iPhone store on the road. A lot of people have been talking about either living remotely somewhere cheaper or literally getting in an RV and, and going on the road. Now, if you wanna do that and run your own store, you need something small and expensive. Here's the thing where resellers get in trouble. People always try to list themselves out of slow sales. Sales are bad, so I'm gonna double my listing goal. Instead of 10, I'm gonna do 20 a day. Instead of 20, I'm gonna do 40 a day. I know from experience that it does, that does not work. From my own experience and from listening to thousands of resellers over the years, if you have 200 bad items in your store, you can't double it or triple it to 600 items in your store and your sales improve. It actually gets worse because eBay has decided, okay, wow, this person is just listing all their junk. I heard somebody say, when I can't reach my listing goal, I just list 100 postcards to keep the algorithm happy. I know they're never gonna sell, but it keeps eBay happy. That is not true. It does not work that way. It's better to list nothing than a hundred garbage items because you're telling the algorithm that when you don't have good items, you list a whole bunch of junk. I don't want to be in that category. So I have decided that I would rather list inconsistently but list good items than list consistently bad items. Because here's the thing. Let's say that you can list five good items a week and one day a week, Saturday, but you can't list the other days eBay is gonna learn in the algorithm that you list five really good items every single Saturday because you go garage selling and they'll get used to that algorithm. eBay funnels traffic based on what it can predict you to do, right? The algorithm is automated, it's not a person, it's just based on your frequency. So if you're always uploading every single week on the same day, only quality items, you're gonna be perfectly fine. I've done this in my, in, in my business right now, I'm trying to only do shows on whatnot that are worth people's time. And I'm just thinking, it's actually better to cut the number of shows I do in half and make sure every single show is an amazing show with an amazing inventory, amazing ship time. And to do that, it requires way more planning, way more prep. Instead of just like randomly listing things, I like sit down, really try to find a quality stream and try to get quality products and really make sure that I'm, I'm doing the right items 
in the right way to get the most amount of money. So I want to take the stigma away from listing bad items instead of listing no items. Everyone listening right now would probably um, rather be in no relationship than a toxic relationship, right? You don't want to be with somebody who abuses you. And that's how eBay sort of looks at you if you're listing a whole bunch of garbage. For me, it's way better to just once in a while come out with a show. You guys know all those people that you love and follow on social media. Like, as an, I'll give an example. Mr. Beast does not have an uploading schedule. That sounds crazy, right? Biggest YouTuber in the world does not have an uploading schedule. That's because he releases a great video when it's done. Like, it can take a long time. It can take two months. It can take three months. It can take a year to really put out an incredible video. And he's like, the upload schedule kind of forces you to put out mediocre items once in a while. So I want to continue that. If you start with quality first, the daily refinement sold method is start with quality, optimize your listings, liquidate if the items are not doing well, and then discard if they don't sell after the liquidation. So the S is start with quality. And this is where people kind of get caught up in this, where they actually just list whatever they find. And I feel like this doesn't allow you to get to the next level. What gets you to the next level is continuously upgrading what you buy. So to give you guys an example, if you guys are listening to this on Friday, I'm running a Spank show right now. So you can go to whatnot.com slash daily refinement um, to go to my channel or whatnot.com slash invite slash daily refinement to get a $15 off code if you've never used the app before. Right now I'm streaming Spanx, which is the first time ever I've sold like a household item in scale. Um, I've never purchased a brand that most people know what it is before. Usually, as you guys know, on my whatnot streams, I'm streaming sort of like these D to C direct to consumer smaller brands. And that's what I've been successful on in the past, but I've never been able to curate or find a large deal of one brand that everyone has heard of. And Spanx, everyone has heard of, they mainly sell um, leggings, tights, shapewear, um, undergarments, oh, and even now they actually do sell clothing. I would say if you if you look on eBay for Spanx, you can see that there's plenty of souls in the $200 range for Spanx that are just clothing and sets. So Spanx is doing really well. I was finally got a mainstream brand and it made me think something totally different. Like if you look at the souls for Spanx on eBay, there are thousands and thousands of items sold. I think 20,000 items sold. That's so different than me selling like clove shoes as an example and there being 200 sold. It's just a totally different ballpark, but I didn't start there. It took me eight years to finally get a deal with a mainstream brand, right? And it's kind of a, on the lower tiers, nothing like Nike or Under Armour or Adidas or Carhartt, like those big juggernauts. Um, and most of those deals obviously are going to big retailers like TJ Maxx, Saks Off Fifth Avenue, the bigger uh, liquidation companies get those major brands but i just want to point out that me getting my first deal with a big major brand is the same thing as getting your first deal from a garage sale like when you're at a garage sale you want to figure out how to help that person and that person is doing a couple of things they're either trying to make extra money or they're trying to clear space and for me personally i only want to go to places that they're trying to clear space because I can help with them clearing space. I don't want to help people make extra money at a garage sale. Like if I only want to pay a dollar, I'm not going to say, I know you're trying to make extra money. So instead of paying you a dollar, I'm going to give you 50. It doesn't work that way. I'm trying to like buy at a price that makes sense for me to flip it and make a little bit of money and, or a lot of bit of money. The, essentially, if I have more knowledge than that person on that item and they think $5 is good for them and I can resell for 500, to me, there's no moral issue there because they are happy with the $5. Now, here's the thing. Should you educate the seller? Do you guys think that there's a threshold? Like if, if somebody has a $20,000 object and they want $10 for it, should you tell them, hey, look, um, I'd love to buy this from you for 10, but I'd like to give you a more fair offer and I'll give you $1,000 for this. I'm gonna sell for 20,000. Maybe if you have other stuff that you're trying to sell, you can call me next time, or maybe I can get a deal on the rest of your things, but this is severely undervalued. Do you feel like you are morally obligated to help somebody get a good deal? For me, I'm just looking at how I can help people. And I'm gonna give you guys a couple of stories here that have really helped me in the last couple of weeks. One is I've been dry on inventory. So I just bought 
this stuff called Tommy Copper. Um, it sells on eBay for between $12 and $20. It's like pretty decent sell through rate, 0.5% sell through rate. And I bought it for a couple of bucks because I want to get in with this new supplier. And I don't want Tommy Copper. It's accessories and um, performance outerwear, which has nothing to do with my category, which is women's clothing. The reason why I decided to buy it is because I wanted to get in with this guy and he works at a major 3PL, which is a third party logistics company. So they handle the shipping for a whole bunch of companies and they had this Tommy Copper sitting there taking up space. So his problem is he has this Tommy Copper taking up space in his warehouse. And I'm like, let me take that problem from you. And I started there. He then called me with a deal from a 3PL in LA who had the same problem. He was shipping stuff from one location to another. And he said, I need to get this stuff out of here because it's in the way. I have 11 pallets of handbags, like Macy's level handbags, so like Tommy Hilfiger range, um, Calvin Klein. And he said, do you know anybody that can buy handbags? And he said, yes, I have a friend in California that can buy it from you. It'll be cheap freight. He calls me and says, hey, Chris, I want to make $1 per handbag. There's 2,217 handbags. What do you want to do? So I said, okay, what does the guy want per bag? And he said, $5.50. I said, well, let's do this. Can you help me negotiate 50 cents off the deal so I can get each handbag for $5? I'll give you a dollar. So now I'm in at six. I'll pay shipping. It's Friday. I will call my transit guy and I'll book transit on Monday. So all this guy has to do is accept payment today. Tell me exactly how many bags they are. We'll pick up on Monday and good to go. And so... The guy negotiated $5, I gave him a dollar, so I zelled one guy um, $2,217, and I zelled the other guy $11,000 for, for $5 per piece. And Zell is really quick, it's also easy to send a 1099 to get that to be an easy write-off on, um, on your taxes. Just make sure that the cost of goods receipt that you get just matches the invoice that you get from them. But I found Zelle to be so much better than wire transfer on a smaller transaction because they get it instantly and it builds that kind of like personal basis because it's usually their phone number or their email and now you're like dealing with them very intimately. So I ended up having that pallet picked up. Yesterday was Monday. It was supposed to arrive tomorrow, which is Wednesday, but it arrived today, which I thought that would be the case because it's only about five hours from here. So logistics for me is about common sense because the carriers don't know, the truckers don't know, the people receiving have no idea. So you as the person doing the logistics, you have to just sort of estimate how long things are gonna take. So yesterday we had a whole bunch of protests here because of, um, the Free Palestine thing is happening. The protests are happening here right now. So pretty much all of our freeways were shut down yesterday for five hours. So it made me think, okay, you know what? Even though it's only four hours away, potentially right now, um, it's going to take two days to get here. So they estimated it would be here Wednesday. But what I'm going to do is plan for it coming Tuesday or Wednesday. Most likely from LA to here, it's not going to take longer than 12 hours. And it ended up arriving a few hours ago. It ended up only taking the person five hours to drive up here. They loaded it last night and then they came up here this morning and it arrived on time. And so look at how fast this transaction happened. I bought Tommy Copper last Monday, so eight days ago. And that Tommy Copper, it hasn't even arrived yet because it came from New Jersey, LTL, which is less than truckload. And it takes two weeks or something to get here. When you're shipping a small amount of pallets, it takes a really long time to ship. So that's not here yet but the referral deal is already done. So I did that deal, the deal to get in with this guy. I'm in with this guy, he gave me another deal. And that deal essentially is gonna make me enough money to get the Tommy Copper for free. So it's like, in this scenario, you're tr I'm trying to build the relationship. So whatever his problem is, now my problem. And I know this guy's gonna call me every time he has something in LA because it's very expensive to ship something coast to coast. We're talking between $4,500 per truck to $7,000 per truck, depending on what it is, where it's driving through. And it's always good to have a good idea of what's gonna happen before it happens so that you can estimate it. So um, the five trailers that I had that arrived yesterday, they actually left New Jersey on Thursday. So that's Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They arrived on Monday. That's five, that's five calendar days. 
And I know that these guys, a lot of them do like scheduling that Friday morning um, or Thursday morning pickup and they can get back here like on a Monday or Tuesday and hopefully they get one more pickup on the way back. So they're like super motivated to get here from East Coast to West Coast to give themselves enough time to pick up a trip, a trip on the way back. Because it's really sad driving all the way across the United States and then having making no money on the drive all the way home. So if you were able to get like a deal that goes both ways, now you're really saving a lot of money for the trucker because you're just paying for their time and you might save three, four, five thousand dollars on one trip if you have it two way, right? So it's like why airports prefer booking you um, round trip. It's actually like against airport terms of use to book two trips front and back and only use one because like that's like not how they want you to do it like they're giving you a discount rate because you're flying round trip if you're using the round trip to abuse it to do one way you're gonna get in trouble so like it's important to understand all these rules and have an idea of why things might be early and one why things might be late so even though they had scheduled me deliveries on different days I knew that it's going to be early in this scenario because they want to get to the next shipment. Other scenarios like this LTL, I have to wait for these three pallets in New Jersey to get bundled with other ones to come over here. And that can take weeks. You can be sitting in the middle of New Mexico for two weeks trying to fill that container before it goes from New Mexico to California for that last leg. So for me, planning right now has become one of the most enjoyable parts of my business. As weird as this sounds coming from me, Somebody asked me, what is my favorite part of reselling? And honestly, it's the logistics part. I like it. I like planning what inventory needs to come in. How are we going to sell it? How many people do I need? Um, how long does it take to list items? How long does it take to photograph items? How long does it take to ship items? All of that is really fascinating to me. I really like logistics. I really like lean. I really like Six Sigma. I'm totally into it. And I feel like everything is relationship based. If you know the driver, if you know the the seller, if you know the post office person, that's the highest value of reselling that can be. You know where the supply comes from, you know who gets the supply from there to you, you know how to list it, you know how to ship it, you know who takes it to the post office, you know what carriers do with different tracking updates. You can give the customer a premium experience by letting them know exactly what's gonna happen with their shipment and that's where I wanna be. So appreciate you guys stopping by. Hopefully this is in enlightening. I'm really, not worried about my 40% drop in sales today because I know uh, this week because I know I'll get it back later because it's given me this entire week to plan a bigger move. So it's okay to not have inventory to sell as long as you're using that time to improve your systems and look for better stuff.